It's been a year since the deadliest mass shooting in New Zealand's history when a white supremacist opened fire on two mosques in Christchurch, killing 51 Muslim worshippers and injuring dozens of others. Since then, across the world, we've seen stabbings, shootings, the firebombing of mosques and attacks on synagogues. Just recently, a racist attack killed nine people in Hanau, Germany, and a police officer in the UK was arrested on suspicion of terror-related offences. So, how severe is the threat from white nationalist violence? And can it be stopped? Joining me now to discuss this are Cynthia Miller-Idris, senior fellow at the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right and author of the forthcoming book, Hate in the Homeland, The New Breeding Grounds for Far-Right Extremism, and Christian Picciolini, a former neo-Nazi who now campaigns against the far-right and is author of the book, Breaking Hate, Confronting the New Culture of Extremism. Thank you both for joining me on Upfront. Um, a year ago this week, a white nationalist gunman massacred uh, 51 Muslims in Christchurch, New Zealand, shocking the world in the process. Question to both of you, starting with you, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. How shocked were you? I was shocked but not surprised, I think is the best way to put it. I think it wasn't at all surprising, but of course it was shocking and yes. horrifying. And there were many dimensions of that which were different from previous uh, kinds of attacks, like the live streaming that kind of added that awful performance to, you know, an already horrific attack. And, and Christian, you've been obviously talking about this, immersed in this world for many decades. Right. You've been sounding the alarm bell. You and I have had conversations about this in the past as well. How surprised were you? You know, the news came out in New Zealand. Yeah, I mean, I think like Cindy, I was also surprised but horrified because it really did change the game. You know, the level of violence, the number of people killed, the way it was live streamed and the way that it had connections transnationally, how it was connected to other countries, other organizations within the white supremacist movement, I think was, was really shocking. Just briefly unpack that for our viewers. In what way was it connected transnationally? Because we often talk yeah. about domestic terrorism implying sure. it's just local. Right. When it's not. Yeah, no, in fact, those alliances overseas have been forged for decades. Uh, when I was involved in the white supremacist movement in the U.S. from 87 to 96, we were already forging those connections in places like Germany. So uh, I think that it's ramping up. I think that these connections overseas are starting to get more violent. Cynthia, how much uh, does New Zealand teach us? We know we had a manifesto. We know, like a lot of other people, B Anders Breivik, the killer in Norway, uh, almost a decade ago, is a kind of inspiration to a lot of these people. We often talk, and we've talked on this show, about kind of ISIS recruits going online, connecting with recruiters or groups in Syria. H how much of that can we mirror to the white nationalist or white supremacist movement? I think in many ways they're very similar and I think that, that Christchurch was a wake-up call for a lot of people around the world in governments who were had been thinking of these as either kind of fringe subcultural problematic groups of youth or um, really purely domestic problems and it also shows how in many ways it does mirror some of the strategies that have been used by Islamist groups. Um, I think people are realizing that these manifestos, the last couple of attacks in Germany, either the live streaming or the manifestos were in English for a reason, right? These were not domestic German attacks. They were, de I mean, they were, but they were designed to communicate to a larger audience and trying to speak to people outside of the country. So, Christian, you mentioned kind of how it goes back even decades. It was even when you were in the movement, there was global links. But you, of course, joined the white nationalist movement, the neo-Nazi groups, in the late 80s, I believe, when That's you right. were 14 years old. 14. How much has changed since when you look at the groups today and the groups you're studying today and some of the people we're hearing about today uh, in the US and beyond, how different is the scene today than it was in the 80s? You know, aesthetically, it's a lot different. You know, it was important for us when we were a fringe movement to be seen, to terrorize people with the way we looked, the patches we wore, the flags we waved. But because of that law enforcement infiltration, it became uh, existential to that movement to hide to not be noticed, to not be seen. So I call it this kind of boots to suits movement where they've ditched the, the aesthetic of what I used to look like 30 years ago and moved into looking more like you know, the politician. David Duke was really one of the first people to do that uh, when he got rid of the Klan robe and put on a three-piece suit of a politician and, and was elected People to like Richard Spencer today who are known exactly. as kind of, uh, uh, far-right uh, activists in the US. Cynthia, here's a question. We talk about boots to suits. Is that partly to do with law enforcement infiltration, but also how much of that is to do with the fact that the ideology, if we can call it that, has been mainstreamed mm -hmm. in a way that, for example, you know, the ISIS ideology, just by definition, can't be mainstreamed. Yeah. Whereas right now in the US, for example, we have members of the governing political party 
that's sitting on panels with these people, uh, taking money from these people, saying nice things about these people. Very fine people, I seem to remember I mean, the phrase used. I absolutely have seen a mainstreaming in two ways that I think are really important for how this has helped the public find these ideas more acceptable or just less offensive, really. Yeah. Um, they, they are less likely to raise the alarm about it. One is that you do see mainstream politicians here and overseas echoing the same kind of anti-immigrant, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic kinds of ideas or conspiracy theories. Uh, and that's really important to understand that when that it sort of legitimizes. Um, but then we also see this aesthetic mainstreaming, and I think that's a big transition from when Christian first came in, that you're you're not seeing the kind of um, the, the shaved heads and the bomber jackets and the combat boots at the same time, these are, you know, uh, the khakis and the polo shirts, and they look much more like the guys next door than the guys in the area. One's marching with the uh, mm -hmm. kind of... Uh, Tiki torches and right, exactly, and, khakis, and so yeah. that's much harder to recognize when you when you have that kind of aesthetic package. People think like, oh, that, those ideas might not be as dangerous. And France, for example, where you have uh, Marine Le Pen, who is mm -hmm. now a leading candidate for the presidency, came second last time round. In the U.S., you have Donald Trump in the White House, who's seen. I think the New Zealand shooter called him, "quote a, a, a symbol of renewed white identity" in his manifesto. Do these leaders? What I'm wondering is, is it that they're indifferent? that they're in denial about what's going on within their own movements, uh, these quote-unquote, especially someone like Trump, who is a quote-unquote mainstream conservative part of the Republican Party, or is it that they're actively in cahoots with them and inciting them and seeing yeah. them as part of their base? I think what we see across the board is that um, there's a legitimation of these kinds of ideas and words in ways that, um, you know, rally the troops, that get people, um, you know, uh, to come on board, to get people to come out for votes, that um, uh, get a lot of energy behind these kinds of um, political movements. And so I think, you know, it's, it's hard to say in, to, dis, to, to distinguish between intention and impact, but um, I think what's really important is to pay attention to the impact. And in a way, it's, it matters whether, the, whether this, there's intention there, but what matters more from my per perspective is, is what the impact. And if these, if these people feel legitimized and like they can just walk around in public or enact violence, that is a, a problem. And, and Christian, do you think there is a connection do you, are people in those yeah. groups actually paying attention to the words of politicians and, and, and kind of yeah. drawing inspiration from them? Oh, I think the fear rhetoric that's being put out is affecting these people who are unstable. Listen, we are all, I, I imagine, stable people sitting around this table. And we are uncertain right now. We're having a hard time with this society. Imagine the people who are unstable, who are really struggling with what's happening, and the words of a politician might make them so afraid that they feel they need to walk into a mosque and murder 51 people because that's the reality. So, that they so let me ask you a question. Because we often kind of, even when we're talking about the kind of quote unquote Islamist scene and the jihadist scene, we often do a kind of conflation between, uh, you know, people who believe in extreme things and people who carry acts of violence. Not always the same thing. Right. Clearly, the guy in New Zealand, to go and murder that many people, something has to be wrong with you. Sure. Which I'm not going to kind of medically diagnose him, but you, you, you say unstable. Let me ask you this Are you saying everyone who joins one of these groups? can be described as unstable, or are they quote-unquote normal people who have kind of gone off the bar? You yourself, as a very young man, joined this group and stayed in it and became one of the leaders of, I think, yeah. of your group. What was motivating you, can I ask? Uh, you know, I felt abandoned by my parents growing up. My parents are Italian immigrants who came to the U.S. in the mid-60s and had to work 14 hours a day, seven days a week. So I grew up not knowing why they weren't around and not being mature enough to ask. So I went looking for a family elsewhere. I think the misnomer is that people think that Others join these groups because of ideology solely. Mm. Nobody's born a racist, a Nazi, you know, Islamic State supporter. Uh, they find their way because they're searching for identity, community, and purpose. And if we're talking about unstable, I, I think that they're hitting what I call potholes in their life's journey. And sometimes it could be mental illness, it could be poverty, it could be even privilege that might keep us so separate from society that it makes us afraid. Uh, but in most cases, it is trauma that is somehow pushing people to the fringes where these narratives live. So did you agree with that? It's about trauma and the potholes and less about the ideology? Yeah, I mean, the way I have been thinking about this is that, you know, for so long we've thought about terrorism or extremism as if it's a tumor, a few bad cells that we can cut out of society and eradicate. But if you think of it, and it's hard to say this at this moment, but as a virus, you know, if you think of it as a virus instead that can infect people, you have to think about what are the vulnerabilities that people have to that virus. And there are many vulnerabilities. And one might be mental illness, but also a sense of isolation, mm -hmm. a lack of belonging, a desire for purpose, a desire to enact meaning so in their life. So when I hear you describe that, when I hear you talk about potholes, yeah. on this show we've had a lot of discussion, sadly, about ISIL. We've done many, many shows yeah. and many, many panels. Yeah. We've had people like Mark Sageman, former CIA guy mm -hmm. on this show, Ali Soufan, former FBI guy. We've had um, uh, Scott Atran, who studies uh, quote-unquote jihadists. 
And they all say what you say about the quote-unquote jihadists. They say looking for purpose and meaning, yeah. uh, you know, isolated trauma. Again, am I wrong to draw parallels between people who are radicalized and join quote-unquote ISIS absolutely and join... Absolutely not wrong. This is absolutely the parallel that we should be drawing. And actually, we can, I think, learn in many cases from uh, uh, what went wrong in terms of responding to vulnerable youth for, in terms of ISIS and, and Islamist recruitment for responding to vulnerable youth on this side, and you know, on the kind of... Uh, on the side of white supremacists. I think the mistake sometimes we make is by labeling, by, by pointing to mental illness when it's white men who are the shooters, yeah. you know, or the attackers, as, as being driven by mental illness instead of realizing yeah, Muslims that Muslims never get to be mentally ill. Exactly. We're immune to right. mental illness. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and let me be clear about the mental illness. It's the isolation. It's the bullying. It's the inability, in some cases, to have those intimate relationships that pushes people to the fringe. I mean, certainly there are millions of people with mental illness that never become... I want to come back to the kind of parallel between the kind of uh, Muslim white nationalist thing but before I do just very quickly one thing we notice about a lot of these people whether actually whether they're a kind of a quote-unquote ISIL supporter or a or a neo-nazi is whenever you look into the background of these people when the media starts going through their life you find a kind of battered spouse or beaten up girlfriend or some history of domestic violence is why is misogyny why does misogyny mm -hmm. seem to be a streak I a think factor here. It's such an important question, and it's one of these things that we're just starting to disentangle. I feel like both the history of domestic violence and of broader misogyny, and then now this increasing awareness that the whole incel movement is a part of the white supremacist and far-right spectrum, or at least has intersections uh, with it in a way. And I think it's one of the reasons why we are not seeing interventions that address these issues of belonging is because we have to also address issues of masculinity and what it means to be a man in this society, what it means to enact purpose, if you want to engage with heroism, how can we, you know, channel that heroic impulse into something more positive about rescuing people, humanitarian mission, let's say, instead of, you know, restoring your white civilization? Yeah. Would you, uh, you know, listen, I think we've taught generations of, of men not to feel, not to show emotion, uh, to fit this certain mold of who they are. And I think that that's a, a, a white male problem that's been put on white males too. So I think that we have a lot of work to do. The misogyny that exists, I think, is, is really due in certain cases in, to the uncertainty that exists mm -hmm. in these people's lives. The fact that they're driven by ego, but that they are not equipped to really understand how to work with So that what ego. do you do about that? Well, you know, I try and build their resilience, uh, and I try and fill those potholes that I talk about. Well, first you about. have to find them, right? You have to identify uh, who these vulnerable individuals are. Yeah, and they find me. I actually don't go out and find anybody, because if I had to do that, I would be so overwhelmed with the amount of people that I work with. I'm working with hundreds of people that reach out to me on a daily basis. I have somebody new reaching out to me every day. There are some people who look at, not just you, but they look at some of the Muslim groups who are working with the British government or the American government in what's called the CVE field, the Countering Violent Extremism field, and they say, you know what? There's no proof that any of this stuff works. We're Where's the kind of empirical evidence that you can quote unquote de-radicalize someone? What do you say to them? I would say it absolutely does work if the resources are there. And the resources just are not here right now in the United States. But I also think that, that certain CVE programs are making a mistake by thinking they can solve the ideology by tackling that specifically rather than the underlying Social. potholes that are, that are really detouring people there. Yeah. Do you think with the resources it can be done? Because in the, in the field of kind of countering ISIL and Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. very mixed results and a lot of criticism of a lot of government-funded programs. Can you de-radicalize someone in that way, whether they're a, yeah. a quote-unquote jihadist or a neo-Nazi? I think some of what we need is much earlier intervention and clearer outcomes for what we're looking for. So if you're looking at you know, an inoculation approach to a public health crisis, you're talking about 11-year-olds who need to be taught you know, how to avoid, you know, how to respond to media disinformation or propaganda or white supremacist ideology when they encounter it in gaming, for example, which 23% of them do um, encounter, as we know from the statistics. So, you know, when you're looking at how you prepare people before they even encounter this stuff online, then I think you can really easily develop measures that will show us whether they're effective. So one thing I remember reading from Mark Sageman, who's written a lot about this and studied a lot of these guys and, and worked for the CIA, he said, look, at the end of the day, we've done all this research since 9-11 when this whole kind of terrorism, extremism industry kind of gets going. And yet after all these years and all these acts of violence, we still quite don't know what it is that sparks going from having the ideology and marching with the flags and mm -hmm. saying horrible things to actually walking into two mosques and gunning down 51 people in cold blood. Absolutely. I think the one thing we do know is that the more people you have moving into the extremist fringe, the more likely you're going to have to have someone at the far extremist fringe who's going to become violent. And so when we have more and more people um, accepting this in the mainstream, moving into it, being recruited, radicalized, exposed online, there is no way we're not going to see additional violence.
Cynthia, Christian, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for joining me in the arena. And that's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.